come behind us, find us faithful. Amen? Amen. I just gotten on a plane uh, from an extended visit to <clears throat> some friends who were going to leave the lights on. Yeah, okay. Excuse me. <laughs> I just got on a plane from an extended visit with some friends who were attending Harvard University in Boston, Massachusetts. And I had had a short stint studying opera with a, a vocal teacher there at the Boston Conservatory of Music, and I returned for a graduation party. So the next day I attended church with one of our friends, uh, an Italian varsity football player named Chico, who had surprised all of us by converting to Christianity. His roommate had gone to Japan and studied Zen Buddhism, but Chico had become a Christian and part of our graduation party was going to church with him. It was Pentecost Sunday in 1973 and I was, I was experiencing that day my own personal Pentecost, although I did not speak in tongues. I uh, was thoroughly converted from my former life of wandering in sin, thinking I was doing my own thing when actually I was a commissioned agent of Satan. Um, if you don't believe that, then we won't even trouble you with any of those stories. <laughs> well, after I uh, settled myself and my seat on my plane, my seatmate who was looking out the window right by me, she introduced herself and I shared, we shared my newfound faith in Christ. And she was a nun, which was a very safe person for me to sit by. And I was very thankful for that. I felt like the Lord had put me in that seat. And she taught me a song to calm, calm me and that she sang when she needed calming. And uh, it was a song that stuck with me through the years, even though I've never heard anybody else sing it. And she sang this, and I'll give my little best shot at this. I'm not alone, for my Father is with me, with me wherever I go. Speaking words of truth, of courage, and of love, he's with me, he loves me wherever I go. And that was really how assuring it was to know that our Father, even Jesus our Savior, is with us through the presence of his Holy Spirit wherever we go. Amen? So later, as I studied as an older student, um, I think I was, I don't know, was I, I don't know how old I was. Anyway, I was an older student at a Christian university in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The resident advisor in the dorm had posted Psalm 73, verse 23 through 26 in a place where we kept seeing it. And it caught my attention every day. And finally, I just decided to get out my guitar and I wrote a little song that went with that song. But here it was again, quoting what Ray just quoted to us, Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Isn't that a beautiful thought? Amen. And Emmanuel, what we think about at Christmas, God with us, he has promised never to leave us or forsake us. And with that in mind, we're going to explore our study today entitled Continually with You. We'll use the, the thee, you know, is a more intimate form of, we used to have plural and singular <coughs> in the English language for the word you. And uh, we've, we've gotten plural back because we say y'all, or you guys, or you guys, depending on where you live. But the the is the personal and intimate form of the word you. So if you would join me for one more word of prayer, I'd appreciate it. Let's bow our heads. God our Father, we come to you in the blessed name of Jesus, our Lord Jesus, who was crucified in our place to bring salvation to all men who will not reject the sacrifice of himself for them. Please open our hearts and ears today to hear what you taught the psalmist and help us to see you like the apostles saw you and like all the men and women of faith that have come before us. And when you take us home, may we also be found serving you continually in this precious saving faith. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So this sermon title, um, Continually with You, is this about Him being with us? Or is it about us being with Him? And is this teaching about Him being with you or me? Or is it about you or me being with Him? 
So we're going to examine his commitment to us first, and then we're going to examine our commitment to him. So um, I've asked Brother Ray if he'd be so kind as to read for us. Ray, would you please read this one? Right, right there, on, on the screen. Yep. Continually with you, you hold me by my right hand. Nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. Thank you so much. And um, how many of you have ever heard the expression, Christianity is not a religion, but a relationship? Amen. And how many believe that uh, without a living connection to our God, that... Uh, that we would just be really worshiping in vain. Amen. You know, God has called us not to be, uh, we're, we're called to be Seventh-day Adventist Christians, and that's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not just Amen. on Sabbath morning from 9.30 till 12.30, amen? amen? So uh, these verses that we, we just saw here a second ago, they're going to express the fact that, number one, nevertheless, I am continually with you that we are with God, and number two, that He is holding us with Him. He's holding us with Him. I'm sure that we can all recognize the kind of love that's uh, in, this, in this slide here. It's very difficult to be holding hands with another person and not be close to that person. And likewise, it's very difficult to be really close to a person and not want to hold hands with them. Whether it's your child, your mother, your father, your uh, spouse, or somebody that you're just beginning to carry about. And very often, holding hands is the first expression of physical affection that we share with one another, right? Okay. Then uh, how precious and encouraging it is to see an older couple holding hands uh, who have either found each other or they've preserved an enduring affection for one another. It's, it's such a wonderful thing to see. And finally, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, we would all hope for someone to hold our hand here, right? Mm -hmm. In our last days, perhaps, or when we're sick. And how refreshing it is to see the innocent unity of some children holding on to each other by holding hands together. Amen? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and sometimes it's at the beginning. Remember that Red Rover? Red Rover, you'd hold your hands so tight and somebody try to break through. And uh, we didn't think anything of it, of holding hands, did we? We thought it was just a, a lot of fun and part of life when you're an innocent child. So it's no wonder that uh, God expresses His, uh, His intimate relationship to us with the expression, Nevertheless, I am continue with, continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. And whether it's our great big God who is so gentle, he can hold the hand of the smallest and tenderest hands of his, of his children. And Ray, you said something about the munchkin having her hand up. And uh, if you ever get to hold hands with Kyla, she's got the sweetest little hands. And she does like to hold hands. And I appreciate when I get to walk with her. I'm sure Edna does too. Um, if we were to look at, can you think of somebody's hands that you were thrilled to shake hands with and sometimes if we meet someone famous or someone that we admire we'll be we'll say oh I got to shake hands with fill in the blank of your favorite hero somebody that you admired or something so shaking hands or the right hand sometimes is a symbol of respecting and honoring someone and we almost uh, we can see that God is higher than we are amen and we are honoring him as he's holding on to us, yet we are honoring him, and it's a privilege. Ray, if you would read us our next uh, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 1, what does it say? After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. So we can see even all heaven understands that uh, God is deserving of this honor and glory and power. Amen? Amen. So it's not only in our culture that uh, the right hand has had significance. The right hand of greeting is also a sign of a covenant of peace. Notice that the weapon is in the left hand. 
and that's yeah. usually the subdominant hand. I don't want to insult any of the left-handed people, <laughs> but usually uh, the majority of people are right-handed, and so reaching out the right hand is a sign of a covenant of peace. And God has also made a covenant of peace with us. What does it say in Mark 14, verse 24 in the New Living Translation? And he said to them, This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. Do you remember what the angels said when they were gathered on the hillside and the, and the shepherds were there? He, they said, Peace on earth and goodwill toward men. And so God has reached out his hand to us in a covenant of peace and he's guaranteed it with the blood of our Lord Jesus. Isn't that, that's what a sacrifice that has been poured out for us. The right hand can also, we shake hands when we agree on something, right? Amen. When you make a, a bargain or a deal and because of this covenant that God has made toward us, we God's people are in agreement with God's government and we're in agreement with God's laws. Remember, the Ark of the, of the Covenant contained what? The Ten Commandments, which is uh, God has now written on our fleshy hearts, and not just on the tables of stone. So we're in agreement with God regarding His holy character, which is revealed in His law. So when He's holding us by the right hand, we're, we're recognizing this agreement that we have made with Him regarding him being holy. And in Amos chapter 3 and verse 3, what does it say? Can two walk together unless they are agreed? Can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? So if you're holding hands with God, like the psalmist said, he's holding me by my right hand, we have to go the same direction, right? Amen. It's just the natural way it is. So if we want this, we will be going with him. It just to me, it's so beautiful to think about. It. This uh, slide I saw uh, on the internet, and I just borrowed it. It's in Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10. It says, "I will uphold you with my victorious right hand." And Jesus is the victor, isn't he? Amen. Amen. he? When he said it is finished, when he said it is done, by the way, if you say Amen, it's like saying sick him to a dog. So this is not a quiet church. Speak up. <laughs> Cheer me on here. You know, I've had my knees were shaking and me smiling too. So let's just keep it up. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Amen? Amen. Thank you, church. And this victory that Jesus has gotten, where did he purchase it? Calvary. And on the cross. Amen. And that's where you all get to say on the cross. On the, on the cross. cross. Thank you. So you know the answer. Say the answer. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. And the only thing about this particular hand that Jesus is reaching down and saving is I don't see the nail print in his hand, whether it was in his wrist or wherever. But we know that throughout eternity, when we look at him, we will see where he bore that scar of, of being on the cross for you and for me. Amen? Amen. So uh, if you think about it, here's Jesus uh, reaching out. Uh, sometimes, you know, G God's strong hand is a rescuing hand. Um, we have the expression, can you give me a hand? We need a saving hand. And so, so we see Jesus reaching out to who? Peter. Peter. Yeah. And Peter's almost what? Drowning. <laughs> He's almost drowning. And so Jesus is grasping the hand of Peter in Peter's time of need. And God has promised to keep us from falling and to provide a way of escape from temptation. Okay. So not only is his hand holding on to us in agreement and in covenant, but it's, it's saving us. It's keeping us from falling. Holding on to God's hand will, will rescue us from every temptation. So it's beautiful. And I saw this illustration. <laughs> Look at that strong grasp of the hand from heaven. It's God who's holding on to us. And what a wonderful truth. It's not just you trying to get a hold of somebody and your fingers slipping out of the grist. Look at the way that hand is grasping you, the arm, not only the hand. God is holding on to yes. you. Yes. Point to somebody and tell them, God is holding on to me. God Talk is holding on to me. <laughs> that's, that's the way a fireman will grab you. That's, a, that's the way a fireman will grab me to rescue yes. you? Yes. Precious. And here's Psalm 89, verse 13. What does this one say, Ray? 
Powerful is your arm, strong is your hand. Your right hand is lifted high in glorious strength. Now this next slide, um, sometimes we may need the rescue from desperate situations, but think about the joy of just walking with our Father, being guided, instructed, and molded just by being with Him. How close do you have to be to be able to hold hands with someone? You have to be very close, and I love this little illustration because it's uh, two young people and somebody walking with them, guiding them. And uh, that's the kind of walk I want with my Heavenly Father. How about you? Amen. 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 Me too. So this is, um, this is something, does God promise to guide us? In Isaiah chapter 58, verse 11, what does it say? The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. So if we go to that whole psalm that turned into a song for me that kept coming to my attention, you'll notice it says, Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. This is the old King James. And that holding is, I don't know, it just seemed longer. So it feels more like it's a longer holding. <laughs> Thou shalt guide me with thy what? Counsel. With thy counsel. It doesn't say that you're going to guide, in this one, it doesn't say you're going to guide me with your staff and your rod, which is a physical object. This is with thy counsel. There's another place that says, will guide us with his eye. And how many of you had that dad or that uh, mom, all they had to do was give you the, the look, right? Well, the look is okay, but it usually means that you're doing something wrong and you're getting back on the, on the track. But this is, I will guide thee with thy counsel. You will guide me with your counsel. So this means you can read God's word, find out the principles of his character, and then he will just give you that counsel. And then sometimes you just need a word. You know, in the New Testament, it talks about the word of knowledge. It talks about a word of knowledge and um, a word of wisdom. God will give you those. He will not only give them to you for you, but he will give them to you for others. And then when you realize, wow, that must have been the Lord that showed me that, you give him who what? Glory. The glory. You give God the glory because you realize it's really him speaking through you for that counsel. So this, this little piece that we're, we're studying today is what, how we can see that uh, all these things, and it's all about him holding our right hand as well. Uh, let's look at... Uh, let me just, this, there's four parts to that verse then that I want to just summarize. This verse expresses the fact, and maybe this seems redundant, but that we are continually with God. Amen. I want to ask, how could you be a sinner or decide to sin if you're continually with God? How could you be a sinner if he's holding us with him? He's holding us. And, and then the guiding us, we're listening to him and respecting what he has to say to us by doing what he guides us to do. Because guiding is really important. You know, when sometimes when Marty and I are walking, and I, I, I just really like this aspect of being part of a couple. And for you, those that you miss this, uh, he's there, and, sometimes, and we're holding hands, and sometimes we're going through a crowd. And then it gets so narrow that he has to go first. So he puts his hand behind, and I'm getting guided along. And sometimes it's too narrow, and I just have to say, hey, I can't even hold your hand, it's too cool. But he's guiding me. And it feels good to be guided sometimes, doesn't it? It feels good to be guided. And so it's, um, it's one of those things that God wants to do for us. So even though this is redundant, God wants us to be with him, not only for this lifetime, but for eternity. And that's what it says. He will, he will you know, take us all the way to, to heaven and to glory. So can you say amen? This right hand, amen. this right powerful hand is, is holding us. It's powerful, and it means we are always with the Savior through the blessing of the Holy Spirit, whom he sent into the world so we wouldn't be orphans. And that's what this next text says. It says, uh, what does it say there, Ray? I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And isn't that a precious little picture? It's, a, it's not very clear, but... It's our Father's hand. So we, like little children, follow Him, holding His hand and trusting in the narrow path that He leads us on. 
And what love he has shown to send us his Holy Spirit. He said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And uh, well, let's just read this scripture. Here's some more proof that he won't leave us orphans. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. And next. For he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now that's in Hebrews, the 13th chapter and the 5th verse. Because in Deuteronomy, that's where the promise is originally given. And then here it is here. Now Jesus himself will give us the same promise. And what did he say in Matthew 28 verse 20? Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. My mother was on her deathbed, and she would say, He has promised never to leave me nor forsake me. He said, I am with you always till the end of the age. And what a promise. She said, He's with me. He's with me always to the end of the age. I hope that you'll internalize this promise for you because there's great hope and great motivation knowing that He's promised to be with us. Amen? Amen. This next thing just is... Analog VGA. Do so. The next thing I wanted just to you to know is that God holds on to us by our right hand. We are continually with, with Him. And can we be separated? No. Can we be separated? No. no. What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. God is like the sunshine, and that's why they used to worship the sun. He's constantly pouring down His love. Amen. However, there is a scripture that says, but your sins have separated you from your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Now, if it's true that he will not hear, notice it doesn't say that your sins, it says your sins have hidden his face from you. Notice it doesn't say he has hidden his face from, from you. It says your sins have hidden his face from you. And, and, and think about it. It's in stacking up your iniquities, building up a wall of misspent activities that your sins have hidden his face from you or from me. It's, it's me doing this stuff. You know, instead of reading his word and my watching TV, I'm just like stacking up this little uh, wall, building a wall. What about if I'm uh, more interested in... Uh, Instead of studying the narratives of God's reaction and his history with people in the Bible, try and fix it. Instead of reacting with people, you know, instead of me studying the Bible and trying to figure out how did God interact with his people in history, I'm like memorizing the Oscar, uh, you know, the, the latest screenplay. I can quote you all the, the words from the latest uh, whatever movie just came out. And that's, and, or, or what if um, instead of talking, to Jesus in prayer about my friend's concerns, I'm talking about my friend's concerns to others. Uh, this is like stacking up this iniquity, these actions, these, these activities that are keeping me from seeing his face. My sins are keeping me from seeing his face. It's not like he can't change a dirty diaper. Hello. God is here for us. And so how do I get back into that unity? Because there is something that can separate me from him. And that's what that scripture just said. So let's see what the contrast is. This one is actually a good one. Uh, Ray wanted to read it to us. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Amen. Now notice this, that when God hides his face from our sins, he's turning away so that he can look to the Lamb of God who has taken away the sins of the world. He's looking to the righteousness of Christ so he can blot out our iniquities. And when our iniquities are taken away, then we can come, like it says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, we can come boldly to the throne of grace that we may find what? Mercy and find grace to help in time of need. But you're not going to feel like coming boldly before, before the throne of grace if you've got this stack of iniquities before you. And notice that the unrepentant hide their sin and from others and themselves. If you 
don't want to give up your sin, you're going to try to figure out a way to hide it from yourself and from others. You want to hold on to it, you're unrepentant. But not so the repentant. The people that receive a gift of repentance from God, because even repentance is a gift from God. Amen. The desire to turn around is a gift, and if He's given it to you, don't ignore it. Amen. Because it, you may not always get that feeling or that thinking, I need to change. If you're really repentant, they, you can squarely face your sin. Yeah. Now, if you squarely face your sin, think about it. When the children of Israel were bitten by the fiery serpents, God instructed <clears throat> Moses to construct a serpent of brass and put it on a pole. And all that would turn and look at this thing that had bitten them, the very image of the thing that had bitten them, they would be healed. So we have to look at what has bitten us, at what has poisoned us, and what is trying to kill us. Because only when we squarely, uh, squarely face our sin can we be healed. Yeah. If we're not willing to recognize what it is that's keeping us and separating us from, from this peace and this continual peace of being with Jesus, we won't get healed. That's one of the points of the, of the, of the fiery serpent on the pole. It was the very thing that bit them that they had to look at. So we have to look at what we're, we're going through. And if we have a prayer that says, Oh Lord, forgive me my sins, and we don't talk about what our real sins are, listen, if you ask God to really forgive you your real sin, what you're really doing specifically, He will really begin to deal with you on it. And He will take it away from you. You'll watch yourself not doing it as much. He'll give you a week where, Whoa, I didn't even consider that you know, entering into that activity this week. He will do it, but we have to be specific. Now, if we, um, once you face your sins, what do you do? You've got to what? Confess. confess. You've got to confess your sin, and I love this little sentence. Confession means agreeing with God that what He declares about my sin is true. He's told me it's the way, the wages of sin is death. It's killing you. It's separating you from me. All the helps and all the things I want to do for you, you can't have. And if I confess my sin and say, you know, you're right. That, that's really what's going on. I, I have to trust that you that what you want me to do is what is really better for me. It's agreeing with God that what your sin is doing to you is true. That it's really death. It's really killing you. And then when you confess that, Remember, sin is not just breaking God's laws. It's breaking His heart. Because He wants to be with you in this loving relationship holding your hand. And if you're separating yourself from Him with, with whatever, then He is losing all the, the, the fellowship that only you can give Him. Amen. He's made your DNA so specific and made you so personally different that when you're not there, He's missing you. It's you that, that He loves. He's made you the such a special person. So those who hide their sin can't talk to others or God with a pure heart. That's really sad, isn't it? So you want to be a witness, but you keep saying, man, I can't really talk to them about what Jesus is going to do for them because I'm not really letting him do too much for me. Amen. And then you want to go to God and you've got this thing, well, God, I want to, you know, but I really can't really be open and share with you like a real friend or friend because i got this thing over here and I really don't want you to see it like he can. Yeah. He can see it all, right? Amen. But what does he want us to do with it? So what's the say in uh, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10, Brother Ray? This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So here we are, not even really loving him enough to repent, and he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He's provided the answer, my friends. And in 1 John, uh, so how do we get the pure heart that we really want? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to what? Forgive, Forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Say 1 John 1.9. 1 John 1.9. If you haven't memorized this in your Christian walk and your discipleship so far, this needs to be part of your heart because this is such... We're all going to have some stumbling, we're all going to have some falling, and we all need to confess our sins because He's faithful and just to forgive us. This sentence from Alan G. White, or a little bit, was in our 